Hello, good afternoon and welcome to this CREMS uh, webinar. It's absolutely fantastic to have you all with us today and uh, we should have a great session for you this afternoon. So before we um, kick off, I'll just introduce myself. My name's Louise Burrell. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow and I'll be the chair of the session today. And we're um, very lucky to be joined by Lexine Stepinski, who I'll introduce in a minute. But before I do that, I just wanted to draw your attention to some upcoming webinars that we have um, coming up in March, uh, one being run on the 13th of March around effective drug prevention for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people, and a second webinar on the 19th of March looking at stigma around crystal methamphetamine use in a 2018 environment. So you're able, you'll be able to check out those webinars and register for them following those links uh, down the bottom and they'll both be up there very soon. So for those of you who haven't yet joined us in one of these webinar series, I just wanted to introduce to you uh, CREMS, which is also known as the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use, and talk to you just briefly about what we do here at the Centre. So CREMS is all about conducting research into the comorbidity of comorbid mental health and substance use disorders, and we conduct research into understanding how these disorders develop, the epidemiology behind these disorders, um, prevention and running prevention trials, and also the treatment for these um, co-occurring conditions. And the webinar series that we present is a way for us to communicate and keep our lines of um, communication open with the wider community and health professionals such as yourselves. So you'll see here on our next slide a picture of the CREMS team and it's led by our wonderful director, Professor Marie Thiessen, down at the front in the pink suit there. And Professor Thiessen is the director of the centre and a principal research fellow at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre um, and made, has made a major contribution in the area of comorbid mental and substance use disorders. So without any further ado, it's now my absolute pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, um, which will be talking about the link between anxiety and alcohol use, particularly focusing on the implications for treatment and early intervention. Dr. Lexine Stepinski is a senior research fellow and clinical psychologist based at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. And her research focuses on understanding how alcohol and substance use disorders develop and how we can intervene early on to reduce their impact and prevent the escalation, and particularly um, looking at the role of anxiety. And she's currently conducting a world first trial called the Inroads Program, which is an online cognitive behavioural therapy program for young people who drink to cope with their anxiety. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Lexine. Um, there is also the opportunity to ask questions, which we'll then have a chance to answer in a question and answer session at the end of the webinar today. So if you do think of any questions as we go, please do type them in. There's a questions panel um, that you should be able to see at the moment. So type them in as we go, and then we'll then have a chance to have a bit of a discussion at the end. So thank you, Lexine. Thanks, Louise. As you know, um, I'm used to being on your side of the, the desk and facilitating the webinar. So it's a novelty to be on this side and have someone to do it for me. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and yeah, just to reiterate, I'd love to hear any comments or any questions that you have and have a discussion at the, at the end of the session. But just to start out by letting you know um, what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to start out by talking about the evidence for the link between anxiety and alcohol use and why it's important clinically. I'm then going to talk about how what we know about what treatments are effective for people um, who have both anxiety and alcohol use problems. And lastly, we'll, talk, we'll take a look at whether there are ways that we can intervene early on to prevent um, the development or escalation of anxiety and alcohol use problems. Um, but so first of all, just the basics, why should we talk about alcohol? Well, we know that it's a leading contributor to death and disease globally. So this includes, you know, increasing risk of accidents, alcohol-related violence, suicide um, and health complications. 
And we also only need to, to look around us to see that it is widespread and possibly part of the cultural expect, expectations in terms of what it is to be Australian. Um, and so just last year, there were calls from the Royal Australasian College of Physicians saying that it was really unacceptable, um, some of the images here that you can see, that young children are bombarded with messages about alcohol while they're watching sport. And indeed, there is evidence that young children in Australia are being bombarded with these with these messages. So some work um, that Professor Steve Alsop did um, in Western Australia, which I think was really interesting, he asked young children in Australia to identify previous prime ministers in Australia. And on average, they could identify about two. And then he asked them to see how many alcoholic um, beverages they could identify and on average they could identify 25. So just really telling in terms of showing us that even from a young age, people in Australia are really, really aware of messaging around alcohol. And to get an idea of the extent of the problem in Australia, we can take a look at the results of the National Drug Strategy Household Survey um, for 2016, which is a population level survey and it's conducted every three years. And when we compare this to the last time, so the survey was conducted in 2013, we actually see some pleasing trends going on. So some good news for Australia that on average people are drinking less. Um, but what we see when you unpick those results a little bit more is that those changes are being driven by young people and by men. Um, and in fact, if you're a woman um, in the age group 50 to 59, there's actually been a, a trend towards increasing drinking in that group. So women in that age group. Um, so I think that's a really interesting, um, you know, and perhaps concerning finding for us to be watching. And I'd be interested to hear any ideas you might have about why women might be, women in that group might be drinking more. Um, and so despite the downwards trend, we still see that there are some people drinking at very high risk levels. So 15% um, of Australians have consumed alcohol at very high risk levels in the last year. And although when we look at the population level, we might see a trend downwards, we know that there are groups of individuals who are still quite vulnerable to running into harm, um, potentially due to individual characteristics. And one factor that might increase this risk for drinking is anxiety. So that brings us to our next question. Is there a link between anxiety and drinking? Um, we know that 22% of Australians will have an alcohol use disorder at some point in their lives. And what we also know is that anxiety is associated with a higher risk of having alcohol problems and dependence. So Smith and Randall did a lovely study where they summarised data from um, studies conducted in the US and in Australia. And as you can see here, what they find across these studies is that anxiety disorders are linked to a two to three times um, increased risk of having an alcohol use disorder. And this appears to be across um, the different anxiety disorders that you can see there in that table. And so if we look um, at Australia specifically, what we know from some work by um, Marie Thiessen and colleagues is that one in three people who has a substance use disorder also has an anxiety disorder. So taking you through some stats, and I promise that's the end of the stats, um, well, those kind of stats. Um, what does this mean for us when we're working in practice? Well, the bottom line is that when you're seeing people with an anxiety problem or an alcohol problem, there's an increased likelihood that they may be experiencing co-occurring anxiety and alcohol use problems. So I'm going to share two case examples um, to illustrate this relationship and I'll keep coming back to these throughout the talk as I talk in more detail about the, the treatment approach.
So first of all, Claire, who was um, in her early 40s, married with a daughter. She had a, quite a demanding professional job, which she was very good at. Um, and she just noticed that over time, her drinking had increased um, to between one and two bottles of wine daily. Um, and she was quite reported she was quite perfectionistic, high standards, and so her anxiety was really focused around um, performance, being perceived as incompetent. Um, and then secondly, Luke, um, who is in his late 20s, lived alone um, and was a builder. He, um, his anxiety was really around, um, primarily around speaking to women or quite worse around speaking to women. Um, and what he found, what he reported was that a lot of his friends had started to settle down with partners. And so he felt like he was being left behind um, and felt um, quite hopeless about that. So he drank most weekdays, but then also had a large drinking session on the weekend, which could be 16 plus drinks. So how do we understand the relationship between anxiety and alcohol use? Well, one model that's been proposed is that the anxiety disorder comes first and it gives rise to the alcohol use disorder. So models such as the self-medication or the stress dampening models um, would talk about this, this kind of idea. And it's the idea that alcohol has either real or perceived um, anxiety reducing benefits. And so people with anxiety or anxiety disorders might come to use alcohol in an attempt to manage or cope with their anxiety. And uh, some research that supports this idea is that we see that the onset of anxiety disorders typically becomes earlier than the onset of alcohol use disorders. Um, and also that coping motivated drinking um, is a risk factor for the development of problems later on. But a second explanation for this relationship is that the alcohol use disorder may induce anxiety. So when a person is withdrawing from alcohol, certainly they're um, there is an increase in anxiety symptoms at that time and it's thought that prolonged use of alcohol may disrupt the stress response system. So in that way can give, um, can give rise to the anxiety disorder. And consistent with this idea, we do see that some anxiety problems do seem to improve or remit after a period of abstinence from alcohol. So for example, um, in the case of generalised anxiety disorder, there is some evidence that it will improve or remit um, if someone stops drinking. But because we know that order of onset is usually anxiety first and then alcohol, what it, at best this explanation would um, explain 25% of cases. And so finally, the third possibility is that there's a third variable that um, represents a common vulnerability for both disorders. Um, so this might be a genetic, um, demographic or personality factor, and this might, might explain why they co-occur um, at a high rate. But in any case, once these problems begin, once they co-occur, it's likely that they fuel each other in a vicious feed forward cycle. So this vicious cycle model is one way that we can understand the relationship between anxiety and alcohol use problems. And from this framework, we understand that the tendency to medicate with alcohol over time can lead to an increasing reliance on alcohol to cope with anxiety, stress and other negative emotions which in turn leads to more drinking. And as drinking levels increase, so too does the risk of developing alcohol dependent symptoms and a range of um, potential alcohol related problems. 
So what we see is that alcohol use can in turn exacerbate anxiety symptoms, both through withdrawal effects, but also um, through increases in you know, general problems, life stress, work problems, social problems, health and legal problems. And so we so see here that it can be this vicious feed forward cycle that's perpetuating both problems. And I guess that's why, um, one of the reasons why this is really important to understand clinically. Um, so coming back to the cases that I mentioned before, we really saw that Claire enjoyed drinking um, alcohol as a way of escaping her stress and her worries after a frantic day of work. Um, she found it helped her to unwind, um, but there were also rebound effects of her drinking on her anxiety because she was embarrassed by her drinking in public situations um, and she also worried about the impact that it had on her daughter. And likewise, for, for Luke, we can see the, the vicious cycle. Um, he had beliefs that he can't um, talk to a woman without a drink, that he needed that, that Dutch courage. Um, and so he would drink in advance before social events. But then he would often drink to the point that he might experience memory loss the next day. And so he'd be worried and embarrassed about what he'd said, the impression he'd made, whether maybe he'd been slurring his, his words. Um, so it would really fuel the, his anxiety and um, feelings of hopelessness about the situation. Um, so I want to talk briefly now about why it's so important for us to um, look out for this clinically. Um, so there's several reasons. The first is because people who have both anxiety and alcohol um, use disorder tend to experience more debilitating and chronic um, symptoms. And related to the, sec to the, the first point, um, we also find that standard um, the standard treatments focused more on a single disorder work less well for these people who have both problems. And we see that delivering, for example, standard anxiety treatment without addressing the alcohol issues may be ineffective. So this might be because behavioural experiments or exposure um, as part of anxiety treatment might lead people to actually use more alcohol as a way of coping, so their drinking might increase while they're doing behavioural experiments or expo exposure. Um, or it might be that, well, and, and or, the, it might be that the use of alcohol as a safety behaviour actually reduces the effectiveness um, of exposure treatment. So it is really important um, to have this in mind when approaching treatment. Um, so given what we've seen about the high rates of co-occurrence between these disorders, it is important to be asking about alcohol use routinely. Um, so of course, the simplest way is just to be asking people how many standard drinks um, they've had per day in the past two weeks or the past weeks. Um, but what we know is that underreporting is common, um, very common. So you might consider using a screening questionnaire to help in detecting um, possible issues. So for example, um, the order is a very useful measure that's quick to administer. Just putting these up here um, in case they're useful um, in practice, but I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, the CWA, Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment for Alcohol Revised can be useful for decision making about whether people might require supervised um, withdrawal management, uh, SADQ um, to get at the severity of someone's dependence. Um, and lastly, the alcohol expectancies questionnaire might be helpful for identifying the positive expectancies that may influence drinking and may require cognitive um, challenging in treatment. So for example, beliefs about alcohol helping to make you feel strong, sexy and ready to take on the world um, might be unrealistic when compared to the reality of a, of a night out drinking. So these are the kind of expectancies that we, that we might need to be challenging or want to know about because they might need to be um, given some time in, in treatment. 
or likewise the belief that beer helps with courtship and improves dancing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, likewise the belief that beer helps with courtship and improves dancing compared to the less desirable effects that we know um, drinking can have. So um, when we're asking clients about alcohol use, we know that a non-confrontational motiv motivating approach is most effective. And this may include um, exploring the person's ambivalence around their drinking, the reasons that they like drinking, because we know they're, they're not drinking for no reason. There are reasons that they're things they're getting out of um, drinking. But we also want to be eliciting some of the reasons that they might want to change. Um, and we know that as well that motivation to change is likely to fluctuate over the course of treatment. So it's likely that these conversations where we understand that ambivalence between I like drinking but really I shouldn't drink so much because it's causing problems are going to be um, need to be revisited over the course of treatment. So coming back to Claire and Luke, um, in terms of their, their motivations um, to drink and also motivations to change, for Claire we really saw that alcohol was a way of escaping her anxiety after a long day um, and her motivations were to change were around the embarrassment it caused her and the impact um, it had on her daughter, not wanting to model drinking as a way of coping for, for her daughter. Um, and for Luke, his reasons for use were to help him talk to women um, and his reasons for wanting to change were not wanting to use alcohol as a crutch, feeling embarrassed about his drunken behaviour and fearing that he was or would become um, an alcoholic. Okay, so coming now um, to the second part, what are the effective um, treatment approaches when these problems do go together? So for people with co-occurring anxiety and substance use problems, services tend to be set up such that uh, some services specialise in treatment of substance, while others specialise in treatment of anxiety. So it means having to choose or accessing treatment from two different places. And this can mean that people with both problems get stuck on a comorbidity roundabout where they're being referred on from one service to the next because of their dual problem presentation. And so a really important question is whether it would be better to treat these problems together. And the reasons to do this would be that people with these problems don't do so well with standard treatment approaches, as I mentioned before, and also that people see these problems as interrelated. So it's important to address this, this interconnection. Um, so in terms of um, past attempts to look at treating um, the problems together, well, unfortunately, this hasn't um, been too successful in the past. Past, but past, treat, past attempts um, involved parallel or sequential um, treatments. So meaning that people either went to one therapist for their anxiety and one therapist um, for their alcohol at the same time, or first they saw one therapist um, for alcohol and then they saw another therapist for anxiety. So the previous attempts didn't actually integrate the two approaches um, together. And in one case, they're actually the Randall um, study that I've got here on the slide, they actually found worse alcohol outcomes using a parallel dual focused um, treatment. And what Randall um, and colleagues said about this was that the worst outcomes may have been due to the fact that drinking increased as a coping mechanism while clients were being encouraged to do um, exposure tasks. They also discussed the fact that there's a huge cognitive load when you're trying to do two treatments from separate um, psychologists at separate clinics. So this might have been confusing or overwhelming um, 
for people. So due to the interconnections between disorders, what we really need is an integrated treatment approach where we're helping clients explicitly to address the links between those disorders rather than um, you know, relying on them to do that themselves. And so I'm going to tell you now about some work um, funded by the NHMRC where we actually looked at this question of could we improve um, treatment for both of these problems by providing that integrated approach that actually married treatment for anxiety and alcohol rather than just providing two separate treatments at the same time. And so the team um, leading this work was um, myself together with Andrew Bailey, Claudia Sanibali, Marie Thiessen, Ron Rapay and Paul Haber. Um, and so this project was the first of its kind to integrate treatment um, and in, the, in this trial we looked specifically at social anxiety because of the obvious um, links with um, drinking, you know, in social context as a social lubricant. Um, so focused on integrating treatment for social anxiety and alcohol use disorders. And so the starting point for um, this integration work was current evidence-based approaches that were supported for each um, problem. And so our job was to integrate those two um, in a coherent package. And so the integrated treatment incorporated both um, motivational interviewing and CBT strategies. And the skills were developed as part of um, the skills developed during treatment were applied to address symptoms of social anxiety, of alcohol use disorder, and importantly, addressing the interconnection between those disorders as well. So I'm going to talk you briefly through um, the components of treatment. Um, but I'd also refer you to this paper in Cognitive and Behavioural Practice where we describe the treatment in detail and also the clinical application um, with case vignettes. So that's a great place to go if you want more information um, and are thinking about implementing an integrated treatment yourself. Um, so, but just talking you briefly through the program components, first of all, um, having that motivational um, interviewing and enhancement. We know that alcohol dependence is very powerful and that the people we're seeing in treatment have tried before to reduce their drinking um, but feel a lack of confidence that they'll be able to stop. So really enhancing their motivation, um, having a collaborative understanding of the problem and their goals, um, you know, but also enhancing their, their self-efficacy um, in their own abilities to make changes. And so early on, um, alcohol is the focus of treatment um, because we're trying to make some um, early gains um, to help get some, you know, initial relief, um, helping to reduce some of the chaos that might be surrounding the person due to their alcohol use and help them to be able to benefit um, most from the treatment. Um, and so for this reason, abstinence is usually suggested as the goal um, initially in order to build that momentum and begin to reduce the dependence on alcohol. But as the program is embedded in a motivational framework, goals are set collaboratively with the client rather than opposed. So it may be that you come to a goal other than an abstinence goal um, because that's what the client is wanting. Secondly, building coping skills and social support, working with the client to identify and manage triggers um, for drinking and or anxiety, um, and also enhance, enhancing those social support networks because we know that people with these problems are often isolated and lacking um, support. And so there's also a focus on sober friendships. So um, getting people to identify those friendships that don't revolve around alcohol, their existing networks may be mostly uh, drinking buddies. Um, and similarly, often people's activities, interests and friendships have come to revolve around drinking. And so the client is supported to re-engage with other interests um, 
and develop, sorry, re-engage with their old um, interests other than alcohol and also to develop new interests. We'd also be working with the client um, to help manage the thinking processes that contribute to anxiety and drinking. And this includes uncovering some of the drinking that some of the thinking that might drive the interrelationship between social anxiety and drinking. So such as positive beliefs that people might have um, about the function of alcohol, uh, such as alcohol makes me more interesting or makes me perform better socially. So the client would critically evaluate these beliefs and consider how um, realistic they are. So working on that drinking thinking um, is something they would do in addition to applying that same skill to the, uh, the thinking that might be driving their social anxiety. So that high expectation um, interpretation bias towards uh, negative, expecting negative social consequences. Um, and people with social anxiety have often come to avoid many different types of social situations and so the next part of treatment encourages them to gradually reduce their avoidance and practice new coping strategies to manage their anxiety rather than using um, alcohol in these situations. So this approach is in contrast to some alcohol treatment approaches which might encourage people to avoid any cues that might trigger anxiety. Um, instead of this, what you're doing with integrated treatment is encouraging people to gradually build up their capacity to handle these situations without alcohol, obviously in a very supported and graduated way. Um, research also tells us that people with anxiety are sensitive to any cues or signs of negativity or judgment from other people. Um, and being attentive to these signs does mean that one is likely to notice signs of negative feedback more often. And this also contributes to anxiety. So uh, this attention training component of the program helps to reduce this hypervigilance and also provides um, techniques to help people to disengage their attention and refocus from sticky or repetitive um, thought cycles that might contribute to their anxiety and their drinking. And finally, towards the end of treatment, um, we work with clients to make a plan for how to continue change and how they might deal with any setbacks that arise. But what you really want to know, I told you a fair bit about the treatment, but what you really want to know is, well, does it work? Um, so what we did was a randomised controlled trial where we, um, where we asked that exact, that exact question. And what we looked at was whether this integrated treatment that I've just described, so there was 10 sessions covering those components, whether it would improve outcomes um, for people that were diagnosed with both a social anxiety and an alcohol use disorder. Um, and we compared, the comparison was with the treatment just focused on alcohol use only. Um, and so in the trial, um, as you can see, this was the 10 sessions delivered by clinical psychologists um, of the integrated treatment. And then there was the same number of treatment sessions in the alcohol only um, treatment. So it also focused, it also incorporated CBT and motivational interviewing, but it focused only on helping people to reduce their alcohol use. So without that anxiety, dual focus. And what we were looking at in the trial was how we were doing in terms of clients' outcomes, um, in terms of their social anxiety symptoms, their number of drinks that, were um, that they consumed, their uh, severity of dependence, and also their overall functioning and quality of life. Um, so as you can see, we had uh, quite good treatment um, completion rates um, around well, high 70%, um, which, is, which is good in the field of um, alcohol use treatment particularly. 
Um, and so we were assessing people to see how they were going in terms of their outcomes at post-treatment and then later at three months and six months to see whether they were able to sustain um, any benefits um, that they'd achieved. And so cutting now to the results. Well, first of all, as you can see here, um, this shows the in the red the people who were allocated to receive the integrated treatment. Um, so that one-on-one -on -one, 10 sessions of integrated treatment. And as you can see, their alcohol, sorry, their um, social anxiety symptoms reduced more than those that got only the alcohol treatment, as we would expect, um, at post. And then they were able to sustain that out until the, the six-month follow-up point. Um, now, secondly, their alcohol consumption. So this slide is very interesting to me because what we see is that both groups experienced um, a significant drop in their alcohol use, um, but there was no difference between the groups. So both, <coughs> excuse me, both groups experienced similar benefits in terms of the decrease in their alcohol use. And I find this really um, exciting because in the integrated treatment condition, as I said before, people were being encouraged to reduce their social avoidance. So they were attending more social events, they were attending more um, activities with people. And these are people who in the past tended to medicate their social anxiety by using alcohol. But what we see here is that they're managing to engage with social events and activities while at the same time they're reducing um, their drinking as much as those that were just focusing on their drinking. Um, so this is what we wanted to see um, and so that's very pleasing as well. Um, and you get a similar pattern with the alcohol dependence both groups um, decreasing to a similar degree. And then finally, we're also very pleased to see that providing the integrated treatment also improved people's overall quality of life. So things were going better um, for people that got the integrated treatment in their work, in their relationships, um, and this difference was sustained um, across the follow-up period. So that's a bit of a whirlwind um, a summary of our trial, but just to pack it all together for you, um, in terms of what we found was that with the same number of treatment sessions, the integrated treatment, the one that simultaneously treated their anxiety and their alcohol use by the same therapist, led to better, better social anxiety outcomes, equivalent reductions in alcohol consumption, better overall functioning and quality of life. Um, I didn't show you this in the interest of time, but we also saw lower depression um, for those people who got the integrated treatment at the six month follow up point. And in terms of the question of whether we should treat anxiety and alcohol use together, I also think it's really um, relevant that people tend to see their anxiety and alcohol use as interrelated. Um, and so providing an integrated treatment is in line with their experience um, and helps them, gives them explicit advice about how they might address the interconnection between those problems that they're seeing. So just coming um, back to Claire and Luke for one final time um, to let you know some of the critical aspects of treatment for them. The big thing for Claire was getting her out of her really strong evening routine of pouring a glass of wine as soon as she walked in the door. Um, so sh she found it really useful to replace that with a uh, wine glass full of sparkling mineral water um, initially and she also made a big effort um, in the early phase to schedule activities to help her get through that evening without drinking so doing some something outside of the house instead. Um, the, co the cognitive therapy component was very important for her so challenging um, her cognitions that, that were driving the anxiety, um, but also the positive beliefs that she had about alcohol. So believing that it helped her to relax and that she deserved it. That was another very strong um, cognition that she needed to, to work on. Um, 
And what we found was that reducing her alcohol actually had a big impact on her anxiety. She was more motivated to get organized in the evening. She was less irritable and stressed the next day um, and was less worried about her daughter and the, and the impact on her. So that really helped the course of therapy that Claire could actually see as she reduced her anxiety that, sorry, as she reduced her alcohol use that her anxiety was reducing as well. So it really counted that um, belief that drinking was helping her anxiety. Um, and for Luke, he found that if he didn't buy um, alcohol um, in advance, he was disinclined to leave his house once he was at home. So that really helped for his regular weekday drinking. And um, we focus with him on building up his confidence in social situations using a combination of behavioural experiments and cognitive therapy. Um, and it was also important to challenge his beliefs that alcohol helped him talk to women. So by examining the evidence critically, um, it was obvious that the memory loss and the effects of alcohol meant that drink, drinking wasn't really helping him um, at all to form relationships. Um, and he also tested out behaviourally his belief that he wasn't good at talking to people, um, talking to women without a drink by attempting um, this sober, um, gradually building up um, to harder and harder um, situations as his confidence increased. Okay, so finally, um, for the last part of the webinar, I'd just like to... Um, shift from this focus on treatment and um, best approaches for people who have both anxiety and alcohol use disorders um, to talk a little bit about early intervention and whether we can um, get in early and do something to prevent escalation of anxiety and alcohol use problems before they come become um, entrenched. So shifting it back and, and going earlier. Um, and this is a really important goal because we know that the average, some work by Kath Chapman tells us that for someone who has an alcohol use, use disorder, they usually take 18 years from the onset of the disorder until when they get treatment. Um, so if we could intervene earlier before those problems become entrenched, we could save um, a lot of that um, loss of, of years along the way. Um, now, one potential opportunity for intervention is to consider the motives that young people have when, they, when they're when um, they just starting out drinking. And we know that motivations um, vary from person to person and they tend to fall into four key domains. Um, and uh, the domains that have been identified are drinking um, for enhancement to make things better, drinking for social reasons, drinking for conformity or to fit in, um, or lastly, one that fits very well with the topic today, drinking for coping reasons. So drinking to cope with symptoms of anxiety or perhaps um, depression. And what we um, suspect or what we know from um, some initial research is that coping motivated drinking may place younger people at greater risk of um, developing problems down the track. So I'm going to talk to you about, about some research that we did exploring whether young people who drink to cope are at greater risk of problem drinking. Um, and in this research, we were particularly interested in the transition to adulthood, which we thought was really important to focus on for um, a few reasons. So firstly, we know it's a time of increased exposure to alcohol drinking alcohol is, um, is, is you know, pretty pervasive in early adulthood. And we also see that there's a peak um, in harms related to alcohol at this time, so such as violent behaviour and accidents. And we also know that the transition to alcohol, to adulthood, um, sorry, is characterised by a number of important personal and social role changes. So such as having new living um, arrangements or a new job or um, a new employment um, opportunity. And so with all these new and exciting challenges going on, 
Um, navigating these challenges may be more difficult if you're a young person who experiences anxiety. And so with that wide availability of anxiety, it might be that the impact of coping styles, so such as coping motivated drinking, might become even more pronounced across this transition to adulthood. Um, and so we explored exactly this question um, in a developmental study um, conducted in collaboration with researchers at the University of Bristol. So this used the um, children of the 90s study, which has a real wealth of data um, on a UK birth cohort. Um, so they've been collecting data on them every week, year since birth. But what we were particularly interested to focus on was ages 18 and 21. And we wanted to know how anxiety and um, drinking that's motivated by coping with symptoms of anxiety or depression affected young people's risk of developing drinking problems over this early adulthood period. And so for this, we used a latent transition analysis, which I'm not going to go into. Um, I'll save you the detail. Um, but basically, this is an approach where we're trying to explore underlying typologies um, of alcohol use. And what we do is we explore those at 18. We also explore them at 21. And we look at how young people move between risk categories and factors that affect how they move between categories. So um, in particular, what you're looking for is what affects how a young person moves from a low risk category to a higher risk category. Um, so turning to the results, what we saw was that at age 18, there were two distinct typologies of drinking. Um, so most people were in a lower risk category, but there were 18% that were in a category where they were um, binging, um, if not weekly, monthly. And interestingly, what we saw is that if you're a person with an anxiety disorder, you're almost two times more likely at age 18 to be in this high risk binge drinking class. So really showing again that link between anxiety and drinking. And then when we look at age 21, what we see is this shift towards higher risk drinking um, at that older age group. So you see there's less young people in the low risk group and more um, young people, 35% in the binge um, drinking group. And then we also see at age 21, there's this new class that has um, emerged, a new typology, which is um, people that are actually experiencing multiple harms um, relating to alcohol use. So such as um, recent injury or feelings of guilt, um, impaired memory. So we're seeing that, that general shift to more risky drinking across the transition to adulthood. But now the next step is to have a look at how does drinking to cope affect the way people are moving between categories from age 18 to age 21. And so people could move, people could stay the same in terms of their risk level, they could decrease in terms of their risk level. But I guess what we're particularly interested in um, in terms of intervention is factors that mean people are more likely to um, move from a lower risk to a higher risk strat um, strat um, class typology. And what we saw is that drinking to cope um, increased, if you were drinking to cope at age 18, you were about two times more likely to move from a low risk category to a binge drinking or a high risk category. So we're certainly seeing that drinking to cope, even as early as um, age 18, is a really pre important predictor about who's gonna move um, into having alcohol related harms later on in life. So, to summarise what we're seeing in this um, developmental study is we're seeing that young people with anxiety are more likely to um, binge drink, but also that drinking to cope um, in the, the late teenage years 
is linked to a greater risk of transitioning from a low risk to a high risk um, drinking status over that um, important transition to adulthood. And so we see this as a really important opportunity for early intervention. We know from the previous work I've talked about earlier that integrated approaches that target both problems show um, promise. Um, but we thought that probably these approaches are going to need adaptation for those unique challenges um, that young people face. And so that's exactly um, what we did in the inroads um, work that Louise mentioned right at the start. Um, so last year I received, uh, sorry, 2016, <laughs> still adjusting to the year that it is, um, I received a fellowship to adapt the existing um, alcohol and anxiety intervention approaches for young people. So into a, an early intervention adapted to the unique challenges and drinking contexts of um, young adulthood. Um, and an additional consideration when we were developing the treatment was that when you ask young people about treatment preferences, there is a really strong preference for internet delivered treatment over face to face um, therapy. And some of the reasons for this is that young people like the anonymity um, that this treatment affords, the perceived lower stigma um, associated with this kind of treatment, and also the lower cost convenience um, and the flexibility. Um, of internet therapy. So they're able to access the tools and the skills outside of hours um, and at convenient times. So the program that we do have developed is an internet delivered um, program for young adults, but it's got that weekly um, therapist support embedded as well. So this is via phone um, or email and chat um, to increase people's engagement with the program and also to assist with any um, troubleshooting as they apply the skills. So this gives you a bit of a sense of what the inroads program um, for young adults looks like. Um, and so as you can see, there are five um, modules, um, each building on the last and introducing a new skill. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the participants in the program are provided with online um, weekly, sorry, the online program plus the weekly th therapist support, so emails um, to help increase motivation and help them customise the skills um, to their individual case. Um, and so we've tried to make the program as engaging as possible, so including um, sorry, just going back, including a journey theme, um, including illustrations and vignettes really relevant to young people, um, and including little snapshot videos that um, provide summaries and illustrate the key concepts and strategies. Um, so the great news is that we're currently recruiting um, for the inroads trial, which we're really excited about. Um, so the great another great thing about internet delivered treatment is that people can be living anywhere in Australia, they can be living in a regional area and still access the program and access the treatment. Um, so if you're aware of anyone um, aged between 17 and 24 who lives in Australia who's experiencing anxiety symptoms, not necessarily full disorder but just anxiety symptoms and is also drinking you know above recommended um, guidelines in HMRC drinking guidelines then we'd encourage you to um, send them to www.inroads.org.au where they can find more information about the trial and how they might be able to participate and if you have yourself any questions about referral or eligibility or about the trial um, please feel free to contact contact us on info at inroads.org.au. So, can we intervene even earlier? Now, I'm not going to go into this because I am way out of time, but I just wanted to flag that if you're interested in going even earlier than the kind of early adulthood period that I've just talked about, that we also have um, um, some work looking at implementing coping skills as early as year eight. So the prevention program focuses on year eight and the development of um, anxiety coping skills as a preventive mechanism to prevent then the later development of alcohol use problems 
given what we know about the link between anxiety and development of later problems. So if you would like to know more about that, um, you can visit positivechoices.org.au where we have a previous webinar that really focused on the prevention program. And um, if you email me or Louise, we'd be happy to provide more detail about that as well. But so, um, in a nutshell, I guess the key kind of take home messages are it's super important to ask about alcohol use. We need to really um, provide that motivation, help motivate people to change, have that mutual understanding of the relationship and help people know what they might do um, to help manage the interrelationship between anxiety and alcohol. And it's important to enhance coping strategies for anxiety alcohol and the interconnection between them. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I haven't left much time for questions, but I just had a lot to say, obviously. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lexine, for that fabulous presentation. I think we all have taken away a lot from that today. You've taken us right from the theories of comorbidity into the research into its prevalence and looked at the treatment and that covered nearly the whole range of the age spectrum from adults mm -hmm. right down to um, early adults. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, we've had a few come through. So if you do have any other burning questions, please type them in now. Um, but I'd like to kick off with one that came through at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and we've had a question asking about whether there's any particular period of abstinence or sobriety required or recommended to determine whether an anxiety disorder like general anxiety disorder might be attributable to an existing alcohol use disorder. So I don't know if you know of any research like seen mm. of, of looking at if people have a period where they stop drinking can you then determine if the anxiety disorder goes away? Is that because mm. it was due to their drinking? Yeah, yeah. So that might have come in before I talked about that. But G A, I think, G did you say GAD was mentioned? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so that's a great case of one where often if you do have a period of abstinence, um, then you often will see that the symptoms remit. Um, and so I'm not sure that there's like a guideline in terms of the standard period of time but basically when we approach treatment um, with people with comorbid problems what we'd be doing is focusing front end on the alcohol focusing on hopefully um, a goal of abstinence initially and if you've got a few months would be my suggestion you know at least one but like a few months of abstinence that's really going to give you a much clearer picture to be able to reassess the anxiety and have a look um, you know monitor again where the anxiety is at and if it's remaining as it often is in the case of social anxiety then you think you know yes this is really um, its own independent anxiety disorder but in the case of GAD sometimes you might find that a lot of the symptoms have actually reduced um, significantly which is great. Mm. Yeah great thanks for that advice. Uh, we've had a question come through um, asking whether you know about any existing treatment services that offer an integrated treatment approach, whether that mm -hmm. um, might be related to the funding model at the moment where there tends to be funding for mental health services and then alcohol and other drug services tend to be quite separate. Uh, but do we know of any existing integrated uh, models that are operating in Australia? Yeah, I guess we're at a really exciting time in the field where, because this is all new. So as as I've said, this was when we did the trial um, that I presented of integrated treatment, it was the world first trial of that integrated treatment. There, are, um, I haven't talked at all today about PTSD, but Kath Mills um, has also looked at um, integrated treatment for PTSD and substance use disorders. Um, so the research um, evidence is slowly emerging to say actually integrated treatment looks like a good idea um, but I guess we're not at the point because it's new where it's being regularly embedded in services but more and more um, we're encouraging treatment we're encouraging clinicians whether you're in an alcohol use service or in an anxiety service to try um, to embed some of the principles of integrating treatment um, so the comorbidity guidelines and the comorbidity online training package, um, which you might be interested um, to know more about, you can visit 
the CREMS website um, to find out more about that or just email either Louise or, or I after the session. So that's a training package that can help people to skill up um, on how they might address um, treatment when people have both problems. Um, so that's one resource that's available. But in terms of um, services that are offering, it, offering an integrated model, I think we're not quite there yet. Yep. Great. Uh, people, um, please write in and tell us if that's wrong because we would love to um, be able to provide referral. Yeah, that is but the inroads, the inroads trial is one way to get integrated treatment if you're a young adult. Yes, and we have had a few questions come in about inroads. So the first question is about the cost of the program. Mm. I think you mentioned it being low cost but dependent on financial means and we've had somebody ask um, and how that might free. work. No, absolutely free. So I guess I was just saying um, after the trial, an advantage of internet treatment is the fact that it can be quite low cost compared to a full sort of face to face. But because it's a trial at the moment, we're collecting data to, um, to look at how beneficial the program is. It's completely free at the moment. Yes. So thank you for raising that question. I should have made that very clear. It's free. Yep. Fantastic. Um, and we've had a few people ask if this presentation will be available afterwards and we are recording the session and we'll send out links to the slides as well at the end so you should get an automatic email in the next few days with that. Um, and just back on inroads, somebody's asked whether young people were involved in the design of the program mm. and how their perspectives oh. were taken yeah. into account. Yes, fantastic. Thank you for the question. That's a great another one I should have covered. Um, yes, that was really important to us to make sure that we had young people contributing to the development. And um, it helped me to realise just how old I was when I saw it. Oh, yeah, this is a great image to include and then had feedback from our young um, focus groups that actually know that's not cool anymore. We don't need that image. We need this image. So, yes, we did um, have focus groups of young people involved along the way who contributed. Yes. Yeah, great. And did you find there was a preference for young people to use an online program versus a face-to-face -face program or what was the reasoning behind going with the internet delivery? Yeah, so I, my bias, I wasn't an internet, um, <laughs> I wasn't an internet biased um, clinician beforehand, but just looking into the research and talking to young people about internet delivery really convinced me that it was an, a model that um, I guess as people that have grown up with technology, it's a model that really suits them. And it's a model that I think the thing I'm most excited about is the fact that we can reach people in regional areas of Australia, anywhere in Australia, but particularly in regional areas where people might not have access to um, services that just might not be possible, but they can do this program um, and, you know, and access treatment that way via the internet and the phone sessions. So, yes. Yeah, great. And somebody's asked how a program like this might compare to something like online counselling. My understanding um, is that people in your modules work through that relatively independently, but do you have any other comments about that? Yeah, I guess um, compared to online counselling, there's, yeah, there's a real skill focus with this. So the core CBT skills that the person is working through, as you say, Louise, independently every module, but they are having weekly contact with the therapist to provide that additional, I guess some of the additional things that you're getting from um, counselling, so those non-specific therapist factors, you know, the accountability, helping with motivation, um, and, you know, just answering questions about the, the core components, the skills-based um, modules and how they can apply them in their in their life um yeah i hope that answers the question but i guess it's that combination of having the skills that they're working through developing them up on their own as well as the therapist support yeah fantastic and as you said it's currently still in the recruitment phase so people can go on to inroads.org.au is that right that's exactly right or refer yep, people yep. to and what yeah. is the age range 17 to 24 and if you're not sure whether a young people is suitable part of the first steps are the screening process so the person will go through the first step is about a 10 minute um, survey where they'll just answer some questions about their anxiety and drinking um, and if they are 
you know, experiencing significant anxiety symptoms and drinking at harmful levels um, and, you know, meeting those eligibility criteria they'll go through. If not, they'll be given some um, options for where to go instead. So if you're not sure, perhaps just get them to jump on and do the screening questionnaire. Um, young people tend to like doing surveys, you know, what um, Harry Potter character am I or whatever. Yeah, so <laughs> they can do that about something a bit less fun. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Lexine. It's been a fantastic session today. Um, I'm sure everybody's gotten a lot out of it and it was fantastic having you on the other side of the chair. <laughs> so thank you for, for your time today and thank you everyone for joining us. We will be having um, another few webinars this year, so I'd encourage you to hop on to the CREMS website where you can subscribe for updates to be notified when the latest webinars are coming out. Thanks, Lexine. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.